very happy to be here today because I am here because the Eighth Amendment was removed from the Irish Constitution. And <laughs> Sorry. And I've been asked to come along and give you some ideas about how we manage to do that. I have been described as a lawyer, but I'm here not as a lawyer, but as an activist. And uh, I had, was chair of the Irish Family Planning Association for about 15 years. I was legal counsel to IPPF and for also a number of years. Uh, and uh, I would like to compliment whoever did the logo for the bags that you got this evening. They are chilling, to say the least. But I have to say that many years ago, I was at a conference in India. And at that conference, it was in 1992, they showed a, a, a photograph of two bricks with a stick protruding up the middle. Women squatted on the bricks and were then pushed. And the rest is just too horrific to think about. But that was the unsafe abortion that was going on in India at that time. They, as I say, that I'm also a little bit more conventional in that I still haven't passed on to visuals. I'm still stuck with paper. And I'm a rather old fashioned in that way. But anyway. <laughs> The 28th of May was a truly wonderful day for all of the people in Ireland, the women, the men, the children. It was a day of great relief and one when one of the greatest impediments to women's access to health care was removed from our constitution. That impediment, as you may know, was known as the Eighth Amendment, and it was put into our constitution on the 7th of September, 1983. On that date, 33% of the electorate voted against it. That's the 33. We get to 2018, and those who reject the Eighth Amendment has gone up to 66. That was the vote in favor of getting rid of the Eighth Amendment. But unfortunately, it took us 35 years to get there. And how did we, that change come about? And it really came about by years and years of hard work and political commitment by many activists, and particularly by the Irish Family Planning Association. The, the discussion of abortion was gradually changed from the discussion about the rights of the fetus, because that's what the Eighth Amendment did. It gave an equal right, it gave the fetus an equal right to life as it did to the mother. And that meant that once a woman became pregnant, her right to life was diminished and reduced because of the pregnancy. The IFPA was set up in 1969. It was a result of all of the dreadful conditions that poor people in Ireland were living in, and particularly people who were living in the slums in Dublin where the, you could have families of 10, 12, 13 living in one room. The association has always been a service provider and an advocate, and it's because of those things that um, the association has always been acutely aware of the uh, difficulties that women and families have in not having access to reproductive health and rights. And we now, uh, I'm just saying that I read the research that was carried out by the Center for Reproductive Rights and IPPF and here on the effects of the 2013 and 2014 legislation on access to abortion services here. And those findings resonate greatly with us in Ireland. The proposed legislation that we have in Ireland provides for a termination so long as the pregnancy doesn't exceed 12 weeks, it provides for a three-day delay period uh, from the time of certification and the termination, and the pregnancy is dated from the first day of a woman's menstrual period. It also provides for termination after the 12-week period where there's an immediate risk to life or of serious harm, or where there's provision 
uh, and whilst there's a provision for their three delay, there is no mandatory counselling or scanning or the dreadful obstacles, which I think the recent legislation of 2013 and 2014 have brought here. We still have lots of problems with our legislation and we are still continuing to make submissions on them. But I think the government is pretty determined that they feel they have delivered the removal of the Eighth Amendment. They're not going to go much further than that. Prior to 82 and 83, we didn't really have a lot of discussion in Ireland about abortion. We did have about contraception. But since then, abortion has been a non-stop topic. Since the initial referendum in 1983, we've had eight more referendum, uh, but none of these gave the people the opportunity to vote for access to abortion until the one in 2018. However, each one of these referenda in its own way has contributed to the public debate and education of the health problems caused to women by reason of the prohibition on access to abortion services in Ireland. And I think that is the discussion which we are kind of trying to talk about here, uh, which is how do we change the mindset? The IFPA has always taken the view that abortion is a health matter and is a decision to be made by a woman with assistance from her medical advisors. And since the early 1990s, the association has advocated for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment and that abortion be regulated by health guidelines only. After the passing of the Eighth Amendment, those who opposed access to abortion services continually tried to keep the focus of the debate on the life of the fetus. They described the fetus as a child, they used emotional blackmail to argue that abortion was and is the equivalent of murder. They tried to continue that discussion in the most recent referendum and one of their slogans recently was love both, as if by that was going to come, overcome all of the problems that a crisis pregnancy had raised. However, the moral values of the Irish electorate had changed for the better over that 35 year period. And in 2018, this year, the electorate could, electorate could now see that the morally correct position for many women is to have an abortion. And the IFPA, through its education and advocacy work, placed abortion within the frame of women's health and access to all services necessary to ensure proper maternal health, including access to abortion. You're probably aware that over the years we have had some dreadful cases in Ireland. We had the X case back in uh, 1983 where a 14-year-old girl and her family were prohibited by the courts, a court order was made, whereby they were not even allowed to leave the country in, curse, in case the girl had an abortion. She had, of course, been under 14, been raped. Uh, that decision of the High Court caused consternation, and we had marches on the streets almost every night and the government persuaded the parents of the child to appeal that decision to the Supreme Court, which then decided that a person under the Eighth Amendment could have an abortion in Ireland if there was a real and substantial risk to their lives. We had lots of cases in Ireland about access of children who are in care to abortion. It was very difficult, even they had to prove that they were suicidal so that they could travel to England to even uh, avail of services there. But and in, not only did we have all of those cases in their own way continue to have an educational benefit, but we also at the same time in 2005 facilitated three women in bringing cases before the European Court of Human Rights that's known as the ABC case. And uh, each of these cases was used by the association to educate the public about the awful dangers and futility of the constitutional restriction on abortion. 
We then talked to other groups, to the National Women's Council and other interested parties, in order to get them committed to change in abortion and also to change their language into healthcare language. Uh, we had the help of organizations like IPPF. We also had a, an all-party committee in the Dáil, in the Parliament, and that has been extremely helpful in getting politicians educated. So that we worked, we formed an organization called Doctors for Choice. We had the help of IPPF. We had help from the Guttmachter Institute. And with all of this, advocacy work through the cases, international advocacy, having meetings, talking to NGOs, never allowing the discussion to disappear from the political agenda. When the government finally decided that they were going to have to face this uh, um, problem of uh, women having to travel 5,000 every year to England and other countries to have an abortion, they then did that through, they had a review of the constitution, we have parliamentary committees. And so by the time that the 25th of May came, the Irish public had a fair idea of what the issues were. And so when the campaign started, after that slow drip drip of the 35 years, uh, the public knew and had grown to accept that abortion is a health issue and must be treated as such. So, we have to say that the progress in the first 25 years was very, very, very slow. Things then started to pick up in the last 10 years. Doctors started complaining that the effects of the referendum were interfering with their professional practice. Doctors were heading for lawyers and constitutions before they were looking at the health of the woman in front of them. One woman died because she had sepsis and a fetal heart was still beating, therefore they wouldn't give her an abortion. Uh, we had another dreadful case where a woman who was brain dead was actually kept on somatic care because there was a fetal heartbeat present. But over that 35 years, as I say, the Irish population had changed. Divorce came in, same-sex marriage came. That was a really kind of joyful referendum. Everybody was happy about that. The sun shone. The Eighth Amendment campaign was somewhat more sober and people were a tad reluctant to, to say how they were going to vote, which meant that we were extremely nervous as to what the outcome might be. And for many years, doctors and politicians were frightened to speak out in favor of women having access to abortions. But as I say, we set up organizations like Doctors for Choice, Lawyers argued that by putting in any clause in the Constitution that conferred a right to life on the fetus would result in conflict between the fetus and the pregnant woman. Slogans, posters, radio and television debates, marches and door-to-door -door canvassing were all an important part of winning the referendum. The there are phrases like compassion, trust women, women can decide. All of these were important in their own way. But it's my view that all of this came about because we shifted the debate from the conflict between the fetus and the mother to, in fact, a health care issue and the fact that women should have access to proper health care. The Catholic Church, I think, was also losing some of its control, but I think that people had also decided to make their own minds. But coming back to your situation, mandatory waiting periods, mandatory counseling, and mandatory ultrasounds are all aspects of lack of respect for women and reinforce the stigma attached to having an abortion. These obstacles show a cultural 
attitude against abortion by the medical profession and politicians. And unless that culture is changed, it will be extremely difficult for pregnant women to be treated with respect in regard to their access to necessary maternal health care, whether their required health care includes abortion or not. Women have the right to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, but obstacles like criminal sanctions, enforced counselling, unnecessary waiting periods, or lack of cooperation by healthcare professionals in the provision of abortion services are in breach of those rights. And to get back to the law, I recently read a quote from the South African judge, Albi Sachs, who said, that we need to infuse grace and compassion into the formal structure of the law. Legal obstacles in women's access to maternal health can confer a status on a fetus which diminishes a woman's right to life and to her quality of life and to the quality of her health. And we need to examine the reasons for the creation of these obstacles. And through education, show that they make women unequal citizens and that women's health care services should not be secondary to any other health service. Our laws should be compassionate and should be aiming to improve the quality of life of all of our citizens and particularly laws that regulate access by pregnant women to health care. Women have been nurturing fetuses and delivering babies since the beginning of time and will continue to do so. In general, women want healthy pregnancies and to have happy babies, but that's not always what is best for that particular woman. Women should have access to a maternal health care system which is free of stigma and criminal sanctions, a system which respects their decisions and where the emphasis is on their health and well-being. And by requiring mandatory counselling in the first 12 weeks is stigma, isolation, and unfair treatment of women. Thank you.